years now with the UNESCO National Commission of the Philippines, uh, or UNICOM as we refer to them. This is in honor of Senator Geronima T. Pexon, the first woman senator of the Philippines, and also the first Filipino and the first woman to be elected as a member of the UNESCO Executive Board. And she also established, or was also the author of the law that established the UNICOM. So in celebration of Women's Month, we are honoring the contributions of Filipino women as culture bearers who have been ensuring the vitality and viability of cultural heritage in various communities in the Philippines. So not only have they been bearers and practitioners of cultural heritage, they have also been galvanizing agents of sustainable development. Women have been instrumental in the continuity of our oral traditions, indigenous knowledges, knowledge system, social practices, and creative industries. Our speakers this afternoon have spearheaded various cultural initiatives that have brought honor to the Philippines globally. Venus Tan headed the efforts for the designation of Baguio as a UNESCO creative city for crafts and folk arts. Baguio is the first Philippine city to be part of the prestigious UNESCO Creative Cities Network that promotes cooperation among cities that have identified creativity as a strategic factor for sustainable urban development. Renee Talavera was instrumental in the recent inscription of the Piña hand loom weaving to the UNESCO representative list for intangible cultural heritage for humanity and the inclusion of the schools of living tradition in UNESCO's registry of good seafaring, safeguarding rather, practices. Natasha Tanhutko is a National Geographic Young Explorer, an advocate for culture, climate, and children's rights. She co-founded Kids for Kids Philippines that establishes creative spaces for, from libraries to classrooms for island communities to be able to empower their stories and share them to the rest of the world. So we are very happy to work with UNICOM for another opportunity to advocate for women empowerment, protection of cultural heritage, and the promotion of creative industries. So once again, we welcome you to the DFA and to today's forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, ASEC Cookie Feria, for welcoming everyone to this remarkable event. As we move forward with our program this afternoon, we are excited to turn the spotlight on three impactful women who have made their mark safeguarding the cultural heritage and strengthening the creative industries of our country. To kick off this forum, I am delighted to introduce our first distinguished speaker, she served in various capacities in the Department of Tourism, Tourism Attaché for Western Central and Eastern Europe for 15 years, and as Director of the Department of Tourism in the Cordillera Administrative Region, or DOTCAR, for three years. She held the post of National Coordinator for International Marketing and Promotions of North Luzon and Palawan from May 2015 until September 2018. In her capacity as Regional Director for DOT CAR, she spearheaded several urban rehabilitation tourism initiatives, including her brainchild campaign, Rev Up, Revive, Revisit, Revitalize, or called Rev Bloom. Project Stobosa, Hillside Artwork, Project Purao, White Roof Painting, and the Village Innovation Community Enhancement Projects in Banawe. She was instrumental in the designation of Baguio City as a UNESCO Creative City, among others. 
She is known for her genuine dedication to the cause of sustainable tourism, as attested by her affiliation with notable local and international organizations dedicated to social civic causes. She is a current founding chair of the non-governmental organization Inspirational Women of the Cordilleras, chairperson of the United Nations Mountain Partnerships Asia-Pacific Government Center, and one of the focal persons in the Philippines for the UNESCO Creative Cities Network 2017. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Marie Venus Tan. I don't think you can see me. <laughs> I will move here. Okay. Thank you so much. It is uh, an honor to be here, and I'd like to thank UNICOM for having me as a speaker today. I'd also like to thank Ambassador Asek Kukiferia, whom I've had the honor and privilege of working uh, while, I, while I was abroad. And so, um, I am inspired to be among young women who themselves are passionate advocates of culture and heritage. And that, to me, is inspirational because I think the youth are the next, are the next culture bearers of who we are. And to me, I, that, that gives me a lot of inspiration, having uh, Natasha here as co-speaker and Rene also. So um, today, I'm going to speak about my journey, uh, where I came from and where I'm headed. And I've always been a passionate person when it comes to people's rights. And to me, having been privileged to work as a government servant, a public servant, and having been posted abroad for many years, and then coming back home to serve again in government and be instrumental in, in initiating reforms, in making sure that everything we do is for the benefit of many people. And so my journey brings me to a lot of places where experience has been part of our journey, molding my interests and molding me as a person. Having now come back to the Philippines and serving as regional director for the Department of Tourism, in the Cordilleras has given me so much insight in what culture is all about. When I was in the Department of Tourism, I've always said, I, I also held the, the, the uh, post of uh, Chief Operating Officer of the Tourism Promotions Board, and that is the marketing and promotions arm, implementing arm of the Department of Tourism. And when I was TPB, I always said, Tourism is all about storytelling. And storytelling to me is what the Filipino people is all about. It is not just about how beautiful your beaches are, how beautiful the um, mountains or cascading waterfalls. It is what people want to experience and want to immerse. And to me, our culture is so rich that a lot of stories can be told, and people surely will get interested. And so having worked in the Cordilleras as tourism regional director, I would travel a lot. I would experience the provinces. I would experience how they eat, how they live, what their dances are. I would learn how to do them. I would experience and take note that food 
is part of their culture. It's deep. And so my journey as a, uh, a person who was deeply rooted now, myself, into the culture of the Cordilleras gave me pause to think that all this culture and heritage must live. It must take us further through generational progression. One day, I was sitting in the board room of a popular restaurant chain. And, and I said, will you help me make sure that the rice terraces, a UNESCO heritage, living traditional heritage site, will live for the next millennia. The rice terraces, I am very deeply distressed because it is eroding. The terraces are eroding. Why are they eroding? Because they're not being planted. The only plant that can thrive in the rice terraces are, is rice, is rice. So if no one will plant, it will erode, and eventually we will not have a destination. We will not have a UNESCO rice terraces. And so I challenged, I challenged the board of this chain. I said, help me to make sure that the rice terraces live. And so I said, you use rice in all of your restaurants. Why not order rice from the rice terraces? That day, immediately that day, they signed. They signed a memorandum and they signed a order <laughs> to now start getting all the rice from the north. But you see, the rice in the north, in the rice terraces, are only harvested once a year. And so it makes it a little bit more expensive and it cannot really provide the demand that all the restaurant chains needed. And so it was only available in the north, but this was a step forward. To today, they are still ordering. And to me, people are now planting. So the next generation find it now even valuable. And yes, there is livelihood. So I, I think these are stories to me that gave me challenges to reach goals. And many of these stories and experiences that I've had, I have had, continues to impact on many people. Even the way they eat, the food that they serve. I made sure that a program continues to be part of livelihood, to be part of daily fare. We've asked people in the North to make sure that their culinary, uh, their cuisine becomes popular. And I said, I helped them also in this. And I said, you have to be proud of your, of your um, gastronomy. You have to make sure that the Cordillera cuisine gets its fair share of, of, uh, of interest by a lot of people. Pampanga has its fair share, Sambuanga, Cebu, and all that, except the Cordilleras. And so every year now, the Department of Tourism in the Cordilleras has already es established an event called Mangantako. Mangantako happens in April every year, and this showcases gastronomy and the cuisine of the North. And a lot of chefs, even from Manila now, are looking at the culinary uh, at, at, with interest, the various expertise of, of the Cordillerans in how they make their food. So now it is continuing. We are providing livelihood for people. We are also providing food as a tourism attraction. Slow food, ergo slow travel. People stay longer in a destination because they want to experience slowly. They want to experience and immerse themselves in culture and everything that is part of the lifestyle of the Cordilleras. And so 
When I was regional director of the Department of Tourism in the Cordilleras, I knew that Baguio has a thriving, creative community. We have two national artists in our midst, Kidlat Tahimik and Ben Cab. And every year in the 80s, towards the 90s, they would put up every year an art exhibit, international art exhibit. Unfortunately, it died in the late, uh, to, in, the, in the early 20, 2020s. And so when I was regional director, I said, I would like to revive this. I would like to revive the art scene of Baguio and focus on its strength and that it's the heritage and culture. And one day I spoke to Kidlat and I said, Manong Kidlat, let's revive the exhibits and we will do it again in November. Little did I know that I was being offered by DTI at that time to make Baguio apply for UNESCO Creative Cities Network. At that time in 2017, there were only five ASEAN countries at that time who were part of the Creative Cities Network of the, of the UN. And I said, why not? And to me, that was the beginning of the most exciting experience and journey of my life. We are now on our sixth year as a UNESCO creative city. We knew, we knew and I knew that being a UNESCO creative city for crafts and folk arts will provide and put the momentum for many crafters and artisans in the region to make sure that poverty, which is part of the SDGs, is alleviated. And this becomes now the vehicle for many of our constituents in the Cordilleras to live better lives. It was two days ago, I read in the newspaper that Baguio is one of the richest city outside of Metro Manila. I would like to think that creative industries underpinned with culture has made its contribution to the GDP of the city of Baguio. So I feel gratified and indeed privileged to have lived in a region with rich culture and tradition. Its heritage is unparalleled. It is something that we should be proud. And now, today, I really admire having seen Natasha, <laughs> having talk, spoken to her. I, I felt, wow, the youth are the heroes of tomorrow, so to speak. And I think others will come. And to me, culture and heritage is what identifies us. We are a people of many, many influences. We speak super good English. We are people that are sociable. We are people of the world. We are intelligent. We are articulate. But I think that vehicle should transcend, making sure that who we are is more important and that identity is what drives us as a Filipino. And so as we celebrate Women's Month, we celebrate culture and I'm very happy that the Department of Foreign Affairs has valued culture amongst many of its um, objectives. And so culture now is really something that we should be proud of. We are proud of being Filipinos, but more importantly, because we come from culture that distinctly identifies us. Creativity in Baguio is also evolving. A lot of people, of course, we have the traditional crafts in Baguio, but more and more people in the creative communities now are looking at innovation. I am a, uh, uh, a partner 
of a foundation. And Baguio City provided this foundation. It's called Bio Foundation. Bio Foundation manages a creative community hub called Harvest. Harvest is an acronym for Heritage and Artisanship Reimagined as a vehicle for economic growth, sustainability, and technology. We embody this in Harvest Creative Hub. It is a, a, um, it is a hub where you incubate creativity and innovation. We've just graduated um, the fifth no zero knowledge weavers at the Creative Hub. And now their livelihood is going up. So it is an example of how passion and culture becomes first in our objectives. Preserving, weaving, which is Baguio and the Cordillera's pillars in creativity and crafts, has to live much like the Banawe rice terraces. And this is where I was telling uh, our, my friend here, my young friend, Miss Tanhuko, I told her, you are working with the youth. Maybe we should do a collaboration where we can teach the youth to be interested in weaving, in hand weaving, in basketry. And these crafts have to be part of what we are and where our identity lies. And so the, my journey continues. Uh, I'd like to think that um, our uh, Rene, who's, who, who will speak about Pina, um, creative, our creative hub also in Baguio espouses sustainability, and we make sure that natural fiber is, continues to be used. We want farmers to plant more cotton. We want farmers to plant more piña. We want our weavers to use natural fabrics. To me, our fibers are important. Our fibers have to remain in the Philippines so that we can make use of them. Our fibers should not be exported. It should be part of the circular economy of creativity, of the creative industry. And so I will continue to be passionate about culture and heritage and how we should preserve it. I continue to help and probably inspire the youth to continue on with who we are as a Filipino, our identity, our cultural identity, and heritage. Maraming maraming salamat po at mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you, Ms. Venus. Your insights, passion, and dedication to preserving the creative industries of Baguio City have no doubt inspired us all. And it's also very amazing to witness the mission as culture bearers unfold even in this very hall. As Ms. Venus mentioned, she was able to speak also with Ms. Tanhutko to maybe start another project. So thank you for that. For now, let us shift our focus to our next distinguished speaker. She is a cultural advocate who has developed programs, policies, and plans with indigenous communities all over the country as reflected in her life and work. She earned her undergraduate and master's degree in anthropology from the University of the Philippines Diliman. She currently heads the program management division and the Institutional Programs and Projects section of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. Her work as a civil servant has been incredibly diverse in safeguarding intangible, sorry, intangible cultural heritage, or ICH, through technical assistance to communities, cultural development efforts, and international collaborations. She continues to be active in cultural development work and management. More than that, 
She regularly consults with the concerned communities, groups, and individuals in constantly exploring enhancements, as well as innovative projects and measures that respond to the times. Some of the most notable programs she currently manages are the ICH Safeguarding and the UNESCO-inscribed Schools of Living Traditions. It is with great pleasure that I present Ms. Renee Talavera. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really inspired by what um, co-chairperson Tan has mentioned. But first, I would like to thank the Department of Foreign Affairs, Office of Cultural Diplomacy, ASEC, Celia Ana, Feria, and the UNESCO National Commission of the Philippines, um, Sec OIC Secretary General um, Lindsay Barrientos, and our colleagues working for, um, for this program, um, Ms. Liza, Royce Liza Malabonga, and Rex in the NATCOM. And for this opportunity to be part of this significant event that highlights the important role of women as culture bearers, especially during the celebration of the National Women's Month. My presentation will focus on women as culture bearers, women as engaged culture bearers, their role in safeguarding ICH of the Philippines, which is one of the major programs of the Commission. And in particular, my aim is to show the safeguarding efforts in the country involving the IP women as multifaceted culture bearers in which I would suggest that the NCC and the communities through the IP women have played a pivotal role. Necessarily, I will give some examples of programs and projects of NCC with women contributing in the advancement of the cultural heritage agenda of the Commission, particularly the domain of the so-called intangible cultural heritage or better still, living heritage. But first off, I would like to extend my congratulations to the organizers of this laudable event. I will conclude with some reflections on the importance of the role of women in the communities and in the work of NCCA and other governmental institutions, as well as our collaboration with international and regional entities collectively working on the sustainability of ICH. Specifically, I will also call attention to the role played by women cultural masters in the NCCA initiated School of Living traditions in this vital agenda. While the Philippines is one of the earliest signatories of the 2003 Convention on the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, it was only recently that the country took robust measures to act upon the goals and mandates of the Convention. Admittedly, there has been an obvious predisposition towards tangible heritage, though not because of explicit disregard, but a question of how we, as cultural workers, tend to prioritize things that we see. In the past, the concept of heritage focused on the protection of built heritage, monuments and sites, and the like. However, there has been a gradual transformation in the valuation of tangible vis-a-vis -vis intangible heritage in the Philippine context. Still, the Philippine School of Living Traditions, which safeguards numerous ICH, has been established since 1995, and the Philippines has pursued various safeguarding activities, and the communities supports the continuous practice of traditions during community celebrations, festivals, documentation of rituals, supporting cultural research and documentation, capacity building activities, and other um, documentation such, such as video and learning resources production. For, as an introduction, I'd like to 
to present that the NCC is the overall policy-making body, coordinating and grants-giving agency for the preservation, development, and promotion of Philippine arts and culture. So NCC is the de facto Ministry of Culture. Out of the four subcommissions which the NCCA has, including the Subcommission on the Arts, Cultural Dissemination, Heritage, and Cultural Communities and Traditional Arts, the safeguarding of ICH through the implement implementation of the various programs that I've mentioned, including the SLTs, fall under the mandate of the Subcommission on the Cultural Communities and Traditional Arts, which is composed of three national committees. So it's the National Committee in Northern, um, communities from regions 1 to 3 and CAR, Central for the Visayas and uh, Palawan, Mimaropa, and the Southern Cultural Communities in Mindanao. The Philippines has currently, next slide please, the Philippines has currently um, three elements inscribed in the UNESCO representative list of humanity. Actually, it's already four, including the Hudhud chants of the Ifugao, the Darangin epic of the Maranao people of Lake Lanao, and the Punuk tagging ritual, and one element inscribed in the urgent safeguarding list, the Buklog Thanksgiving ritual system of the Subanen. It's in the next slide, please. So these are the communities, and these are the UNESCO inscribed ICH elements in the representative list, urgent safeguarding list, the Hudhud chants of the Ifugao, as I've mentioned, is part of the multinational inscription on tagging rituals with Vietnam, the Philippines, Cambodia, and Korea in December 2015. In 2021, the Schools of Living Traditions program was inscribed on the UNESCO Register of Good Safeguarding Practices which best reflects the spirit of the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of ICH, placing great emphasis on the central role of communities, groups, and individuals, and in particular, indigenous cultural communities in safeguarding their ICH. Recently, on December 6, 2023, the Aklan Piña Handlum Weaving was inscribed on the UNESCO representative list of humanity. The tangibility of the SLTs, or Schools of Living Traditions, is able to fully support the intangible cultural heritage safeguarding needs of its communities. It is able to provide a home for the transmission of values and worldview to the next generation through the cultural masters, the women cultural masters and elders, sharing and making their history while protecting their language and weaving their indigenous knowledge. There are several community-based initiatives that support the engagement of IP women as culture bearers, which the NCCA took an active role in ICH safeguarding on its viability and sustainability in support of its um, ICH safeguarding. In consultation with the communities wherein women play an active role, the NCCA has been supporting projects and programs. I would like to mention that in the indigenous peoples, gender domains are clearly ascribed. It's, not, uh, it's more than gender roles. This is even clearly illustrated in the fact that the Manlilikhanang Bayan, these are the national living treasures. It's in the next slide. So I've mentioned the tagging rituals. So I've mentioned that um, gender domains are clearly ascribed. This is even clearly illustrated in the fact that the Manlilikhanang Bayan women outnumbered the Manlilikhanang Bayan men. So I, I will show you that uh, we have a lot of national living treasures and uh, the specialization that women are best about. So we... Um, I also would like to share some, some terms, um, terms that other communities use for women. So, babaye, denda, baye, babaye, bae, babai, bubai, buhe, bayi, maritan, libun, babaye, bahe. So, maybe some of you have roots um, in these communities like Samar, Cebuano, Boholano would, would relate. So, women are seed keepers in indigenous farming. 
uh, in indigenous farming system, while men clear the fields, women plant the seeds and nurture its growth. Women are engaged in indigenous culinary heritage recipes, as mentioned a while ago by our speaker. And also men and women in, in um, Subanen, the booklog system, uh, ritual system, which I've mentioned a while ago, men and women are spirit guardians, but um, women members play continuously uh, the musical instruments in designated spaces to, us, to appease the spirits day in and day out. And gender domains are clearly marked in visual arts, but embroidery of women illustrates the status of men like the eagles in flight, but women are really the creators of symbols of survival. So, uh, as I've mentioned about schools of living traditions, women uh, play a vital role because they are the cultural masters. These are the cultural forms that they transmit to the young generation. We can, we can move the slides, please. So these are just some of the cultural art forms that, that women um, transmit to the next generation. Embroidery, loom weaving, etc. Um, even language, this is a tool for transmitting the indigenous knowledge systems and practices, beadworks, and these are being passed on by not only by the National Living Treasures, which is on the next slide, so these are our women, Manlilikhanang Bayan, or the National Living Treasures. Uh, why do we call them Manilikhan ng Bayan? Um, they are citizens engaged in any traditional arts, uniquely Filipino. And they reach certain, uh, they reach a high level of technical and artistic excellence and have been passing on this excellence to the, to the next generation and is widely practiced by the present generation in the community. So next slide, please. These are our outstanding uh, manlilikhanang bayan in the country. And I would like to talk on the schools of living traditions. The schools of living traditions are non-formal centers of learning. These are community-based and community-managed, wherein the cultural master, which uh, mostly are women, transmit their knowledge on certain art and craft to the next generation. So this is also inscribed in the UNESCO um, list of good um, safeguarding register of good safeguarding practice. We have been assisting the schools of living traditions all over the country. And um, it's good that this uh, program received global recognition. So next slide, please. I would like to show you some of the schools of living traditions, the art forms that, be, uh, that are being taught, and the cultural masters who we should be giving um, recognition during this um, National Women's Month celebration. So we can just continue uh, clicking the slides because I've prepared a lot because I just really wanted to share with you uh, the photos of the... Uh, cultural masters, women cultural masters, and even the uh, the girls, the young uh, the young girls who are who will be the next um, cultural masters. They are they are under, undergoing an apprenticeship. So this is um, schools of living traditions in Antique, and these are the cultural masters. We can just continue clicking the slides because I think I have more than seventy slides. And um, in Cordillera, Basketry. This is in Basilan, the Yakan women in Basilan. We also have um, National Living Treasure in Basilan. In Bohol, we have the Schools of Living Traditions in Bohol. We can just um, continue clicking. So you can see the art forms that I've mentioned from beadworks 
embroidery, weaving, uh, textile weaving, basketry. These are all um, taught in the schools of living traditions. Most of the students are from ages um, 7 to young adults. So Davao del Norte. And not only that, they also teach uh, performances, musical instrument production and playing. So the schools of living traditions are situated um, in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, and we are assisting the cultural masters to continue um, passing on the tradition by providing um, assistance for their allowances, and even the students are given um, travel, um, transportation, and um, allowances for snacks and supplies and materials. So this is the program that was recognized by UNESCO which places great emphasis on the central role of the communities, groups, and individuals in safeguarding ICH. So in Palawan, we also have the mat weaving in Sambuanga. And in Sambuanga, Lakewood, it's um, embroidery. So everything that you are um, witnessing the, from the head, headdress and their traditional textile are all, um, are all produced by the communities. So at the international level, the NCC has been collaborating with various UNESCO-linked institutions such as the UNESCO Category 2 Centers where women cultural masters are given opportunities to represent their communities. So we bring the cultural masters in international events abroad to also present, uh, to, to provide lectures and demonstration to present their um, skills through these art forms. We also allow the women to participate in mapping uh, activities wherein they are involved in the, the identification process of their ICH element. Inventorying process entails utmost observance of ethical principles so which embody the central notion of a rights-based approach to ICH safeguarding. So it's the community which um, determines um, the ICH of their community. However, there are challenges. Our country is highly prone to natural hazards, including tropical cyclones, hydrometeorological meteorological disasters and typhoons. Some of the impacts brought about by these disasters include damage to the environment and cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, resulting in the disruption of these traditions, the practice of these traditions, lost customs, beliefs, and practices. Through these non-formal community centers of learning, the SLTs, the women, the women cultural masters in the SLTs are actively safeguarding various ICH. However, despite the importance of the program, the indigenous cultural communities wherein most of the women serve as lead implementers or cultural masters of the SLTs still remain as one of the vulnerable sectors in the country, particularly in times of emergencies or state calamities. So that's one of the challenges. So, um, in closing, I hope that my presentation has provided an overview of ICH safeguarding strategies in the Philippines with IP, with Indigenous Peoples Women, as engaged culture bearers at its core. And in a certain sense, has demonstrated that government efforts are beginning to gain traction in the conceptual and practical agenda pursued by governmental and non-governmental institutions in the country. Lastly, my emphasis on the women's role in the NCCA heritage programs and advocacies is obvious a function of my positionality, that is to say, my being a member of the NCCA. On this note, thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you, Ms. Renee, for the privilege of experiencing our country's diverse culture through your work. Thank you also for sharing your beautiful photos, which transported us to different places in the country. As we transition into the final segment of our forum, it is my distinct honor to introduce our last speaker. She is a Filipina designer, curator, and advocate for culture, climate, and children's rights. She hopes to use visual design to contribute a new perspective to the larger exploration of Filipino heritage, history, culture, and creativity as a soft power for systems transformation and biodiversity regeneration. Together with her sister Bella, she is the co-founder and creative director of Tayo, a multidisciplinary creative company grounded in co-creation. Tayo House of Culture and Creativity envisions a renaissance of indigenous and neo-vernacular culture as the foundation to every business, company, or corporation. She also co-founded a youth-led organization, Kids for Kids Philippines, which she began at the age of 15, also with her sister. Kids for Kids establishes creative spaces from libraries to classrooms for island communities to be able to empower their stories and share them to the rest of the world. She is also the executive director of the Tukod Foundation, which forwards the legacy and philosophy of her grandfather and national artist, architect Bobby Manyosa, the father of Filipino neo-vernacular architecture. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Ms. Natasha Tanhutko. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, and just to kind of like break that really long introduction. Hi, I'm Tasha. I am the youngest speaker here today, but I've been so inspired by a really long legacy, not just of my grandfather, but of the women that have come before me. So I open today's um, forum with this really interesting quote that I heard from a friend named June. And I call her a friend, but she's actually also the head of Aboriginal people in Australia. She works um, in policy, and she had this really nice quote about the wisdom of the grandmothers, the hope of the mothers, and the dreams of the daughters. And this really, I feel like, embodies why women are cultural bearers. And it really connects intergenerationally. Next slide, please. So I do come from like a long line of very amazing women. A really interesting story that I only learned quite recently was that my great-great-grandmother is actually one of the only documented 19th century artists here in the Philippines. She started as a young girl. Um, she used to sketch. She used to work for her father's publication. And I only realized this, and so did my grandmother when I was doing research in college. And I really admire as well all the other women that have inspired me. Um, my mother is who's here today. Um, and of course, my grandmother, who has taught me a lot about history. Next slide. I work a lot together with my sister, Bella. We really started our organization quite young. And so that really inspired me to have her around, to really be an inspiration as well, to keep going. Next slide. I work with a lot of women as well across from Luzon to Mindanao. And it's been so amazing to see how really, actually, majority of the people that I meet that run cultural institutions, that head a lot of these amazing movements around their islands, are all women. Next slide. And I do work with a lot of different girls in our youth organizations and in our teams are composed of like 80 to 90% women. So it's really been something that I never realized was something so present within my work until I was asked to do this talk. And I found it so amazing because what makes it different to work with women and girls is that everyone leads with both head and heart. So we're able to find a balance between these two things, which I think are very valuable when talking about culture. Next slide. 
So I've done a lot of field work on the last year. I am working on a grant together with my friends Isa Barta and Gab Mejia. So Isa is the co-founder for the Future Philippines, a youth-led organization. And Gab Mejia is a conservation photographer. He actually was the one, I think, that nominated Agusan Marsh as a UNESCO site. So I've been visiting 17 regions for the last year. And I've really realized, next slide please, that girls are the best cultural illuminators and storytellers. So I have conversed with so many different young girls and cultural barriers with wisdom that have really inspired me to continue doing the type of work that I do today. Next slide. And I feel like a lot of the work that I do is quite heavy because we talk a lot about how culture is, is dying or is losing um, its future and it kind of is passed on to us young people to do something about it. A lot of us are always kind of like now having to take responsibility at an earlier age because of this looming climate crisis. But what I learned from my few years of working is that, next slide please, the deeper, I guess, underlying crisis that we see really is a cultural crisis. Because the reason why we have survived, next slide please, and the reason why we really have kind of continued being able to stay on this planet is because we really see how culture itself is what, is what allows us to understand the important ways of living. Next slide. And that's something that I learned very early on, subconsciously even. When I was younger, my sister and I were exposed to the proudness of being Filipino and how important it was to love your country, not because you were just born in it, but also because there's so much else beyond what you, you normally see at home. Next slide. And so my sister and I in 2015 co-founded a youth organization called Kids for Kids. And this was because we realized a lot of young people had so many crazy ideas and we just needed a support system to come together to do something more. A lot of people asked us why we started the organization in the first place. Um, and we, we told them we wanted to change everything. We wanted to do so many different things. And a lot of adults would kind of look at us saying, oh my gosh, you'll learn later on that you actually can't do that. Like it's not possible to change the world. Um, you guys are a bit naive still. So we got a lot of that feedback growing up and I kind of didn't mind it. I used it instead as motivation to understand why at a young age, my sister and I and a lot of our friends realized that we wanted to change everything about the world. Next slide. And what we realized is when we were saying everything, what we actually meant was systems transformation. So seeing everything as innately interconnected and not creating segments between society, but instead seeing ourselves as a living ecosystem. And this living ecosystem is stitched together by culture itself. Next slide. So we did a lot of work related to how culture could actually be something subconsciously understood by young people without having to kind of put it straight into their face like to love the country, right? Our whole idea was to be able to come up with a way for young people to be interested, to, to question their identity and to question why as well they would have purpose within our identity. Next slide. And over the pandemic, I think that was one of the, I think, defining moments in a lot of youth-led organizations. It's because we kind of were taken out of the system. We were, a lot of us were stuck at home. Um, a lot of different things were changing. And because of that, we were really able to see a rise in youth-led initiatives, not just here, but I think globally. And I think that's very important to take note of because when you talk about young people working together in a very different or radical environment, you really see how young people are the purest form of culture. So when you're trying to see what is going to last, look at what the young people are thinking about. And if they are thinking about that, that's something that will be continued throughout the next generations. Next slide. And so my sister and I um, have gone through many different phases in running our organization. And we didn't really like calling it a formal organization. We called it a movement because we wanted to be able to be free flowing in how we were going to be able to translate climate issues, not just being climate issues, but also cultural issues at a larger scale. Next slide. And so that is the reason why we ended up co-founding Tayo House of Culture and Creativity. 
And that was because after about eight years doing a lot of different NGO work, um, we realized that a lot of companies, these bigger corporations and institutions that kind of define the system, needed help. Instead of kind of icing them out, as hard as it was, what you wanted to do was to invite them into the conversation. So we started a consultancy. I was 18 at that time, about to go to college. But what we wanted to do was to realize and to tell people that even if you are in a corporate business, even if you are promoting a very simple product to a random market, that we needed to switch this idea of consumerism and this whole idea of consumerism, which is not innately Filipino. Because the reason behind a lot of the plastic waste, a lot of the different environmental damages that happen around us isn't because that is part of our culture. It is because it was something introduced to us and something that we also need to take up upon ourselves to change. Next slide. And so the reason why Tayo itself is very exciting and I think very important to share is because even without our knowing, a lot of our teams are composed of 80 to 90% women. But it's also to note that the boys or the other people, all genders involved, need to be part of the discussion. They need to be also acknowledged, to be made room for, to also as well empower the same girls in the room. Next slide. And we really realized that doing a lot of our work with different types of sectors, from government to private sector to other youth-led organizations, that in the end, it's really because girls are able to build community naturally. Not just being, not just coming from like an all-girls high school, I was able to see this, but also in the real world. When you put girls and women together, you create a powerful ecosystem for change. Next slide. And girls also know what it means to kind of lead with both head and heart. A lot of people see this as a weakness, but I see it as a strength. Because in reality, we all are part of an interconnected ecosystem. So the only way really to actively create change or transformation is by really understanding how we need to connect with each other through our emotions and also through our knowledge. Next slide. And a lot of people would always ask us, why did you kind of start a lot of these things? We didn't really have a one particular reason other than quote unquote wanting to change everything. But I think what we realized later on is that the reason why we started all of this was because we, we realized we were born Filipina also for a reason. And this reasoning was something that we wanted to unlock. Next slide. And so going back to the idea again of this cultural crisis that we face, we realized, as the other speakers also mentioned, a lot of the SDGs from poverty to inequality, um, even climate change, climate action, all these different ideas that the Sustainable Development Goals promote, it all just centers back down to the idea of culture. Culture, next slide please, can actually solve a lot of our issues today beyond just seeing it as a very niche sector in, in society. It's actually what ties us together as a people and what also promotes the diversity of our islands. So it's really important to note that instead of, you know, what should be on the headlines instead of talking about just the climate crisis itself, is the cultural crisis that we're facing or this loss of language, the loss of biodiversity, the loss of our indigenous knowledge systems. These ideas are actually what keep us surviving and what will keep us thriving. And that's why we really think when it comes to action on the different issues we have today, we can learn a lot from different Filipinas around the country. Next slide. And so a lot of people I have noticed after visiting almost 17 regions, there really is this cultural revolution happening. And what I see is that there are a lot of young girls actually very interested in continuing their grandmother's stories. There is, there is this interesting thing that I noticed, that there's a gap. It goes straight from like grandmothers to granddaughters. And I think that's the reason why we kind of call it a quote unquote cultural revolution, or at least my friends and I. Because, next slide please, we've really realized that Finding our place in, in culture or in the cultural sphere has nothing to do with your expertise or your experiences, but it also has a lot to do with if you yourself are willing to question who you are as a Filipino, what does it mean to be, be Filipino, and being a Filipino or Filipina, how do you fit into the larger equation of our culture? Next slide, please.
And so Filipino culture really is a tapestry. We have a lot of indigenous cultures that promote weaving and artistry as shown in the previous speaker's presentation. But what I think is amazing is that our culture itself is a tapestry and that it's important to talk about you know, the Filipino nation, but more important to talk about the Filipino archipelago. What makes us so special is that we are a group of islands rather than kind of coming up with a monoculture. It's this idea really of promoting diversity amongst our people. Next slide. And so women as cultural bearers, it really is the women that weave together this tapestry of what our culture is. There are a lot of different communities that really talk about the value of women being leaders. And I think that's a very important aspect that we can kind of take not just within our homes, but also within our workspaces. Next slide. And so the first aspect I think that we weave together very well as women is kalikasan or the idea of biodiversity and environment. Next slide, please. This really comes from the idea of understanding how women are leaders in spirituality and ecology and truly understanding the interconnectedness of our ecosystems. What I've learned from my fieldwork as well is the value that young girls play when we're talking about the future. And I really think it's because young girls are willing to question at a very early age different heavy topics that you don't really realize. And that I think talks about how spiritual women really are innately and that it's important to kind of hone this spirituality to be able to talk about the environment because in the end we are connected to this bigger, larger system that a lot of people isolate. That people say that you have three, there's always environment, economy, and society. But in reality, all these three things fall under the same space. Next slide. The next is kapwa, or this idea of pakikipag kapwa, and knowing that you see the self in the other. I think this is a very important part of our culture, not just as a theory, but literally. If you're able to put yourself in the shoes of another, you're able to understand what issues are at hand and how you can fully address that with creative solutions. Because ultimately, creativity only comes if you're willing to kind of be courageous about what you're questioning. Next slide. And that's why we really have to talk about memory, so the value of remembering and community. And it's important to really note that women and girls lead this conversation. As much as we like to make cuento with each other, it is a bigger reality that actually allows us to process all these heavy things that we take in and put out as creative solutions. Next slide. And lastly, kabutihan. So as we know, the creative industries has been a very good um, way of promoting livelihood, but also it's a very good way of promoting well-being within the self because you're able to express the different things that you take in from around you and put it out again back into the world with something manifesting from it. And I think that's why creativity shouldn't be a, a sector or something that is only left with the artists or the professionals for. I think creativity is something innately human, so everyone really is creative, because if we're able to think about something and we're able to put something out there, that in itself is creative. It's using human emotion and human knowledge and all these different things that we take in, and we're able to project it into something better. Next slide. And so really understanding that creativity and biodiversity are interconnected, that biodiversity is what ultimately inspires creativity, is the reason why a lot of women are at the forefront in protecting also our Earth. It's because a lot of Filipino culture actually stems from our plants and our animals, and it's very important to talk about this in the larger context of creative industries as well. Because the only way really to promote creative industries, even at an economic scale, is also understanding how the environment comes to play as its foundation. Next slide. And I really think that this movement of women being at the forefront of culture isn't just here locally, but it's happening globally. And I think the climate movement is something very exciting to see women at the forefront of. Next slide. And first and foremost, I really think that the reason why women are at the forefront is because we're really able to channel again both head and heart. Next slide, please. So first of all, women and girls go beyond competition and ego. It's also this idea of really making it an inclusive discussion. Next slide, please. 
Women and girls also center justice, inclusion, and frontline communities. So this allows us to think beyond survival, but also thriving, which is why leading households is something very important. It shouldn't be seen as something that we're rejecting, but it's an idea that we should be inviting because how important are these microcosms of society to the bigger picture? Next slide. And lastly, also women and girls bring their whole selves into the movement we're able really to channel all the different stories that we hear into good design solutions. And I think that's very important because all over the country or all the islands that I visited, there are so many girls and women that have really, really been able to do this. One of my favorite stories is meeting, her name's Lady, Lady Litang. She lives in Halian Island. Her grandfather was the one who kind of is known to have made friends with a mermaid who invited everyone else to come onto the island to thrive. And what I love about her is that she's really able to understand the value of her island culture. A lot of people not really knowing about Hali an Island because it's made up only of 1,100 people, but she's able to channel these stories into a larger platform. She's been able to go to school. She's been able to talk about how proud she is from coming from this island community which is why I'm so inspired when I work directly with a lot of these remote island communities because they're often the last ones talked about. There are a lot of people that feel like they can't connect to our culture because they live so far away from an indigenous group or live so far away from Manila as a capital. But I think we have to be able to decentralize this idea of culture and this idea that we don't need a large institution to be able to talk about it but all we need really are the barriers, are the people that are willing to continue questioning it. Next slide. And I think in the end, this is a photo from our very first event that my sister and I did in 2015. From the very beginning, it was really Filipino culture that inspired us to do the work that we were doing, the spirit of Bayanihan or of the idea of Barangay, this idea of connecting different people under one roof and understanding how together we can make a bigger difference. Next slide. And so lastly, I want to leave everyone with this very exciting, um, I guess, hope that we kind of can be looking towards. Because there is a lot of, I know, pressure on us young people to do something about culture. But I realize that in the end, it isn't something that should be heavy or scary to discuss. And it's something that actually is exciting. And rather seeing it as niche and only being existing in certain cultural spaces, I really think it's exciting to see now how culture can be talked about in different sectors of society because ultimately culture itself and the women that carry this culture are the ones who will end up tying this tapestry together in order to create systems transformation. So thank you so much for <laughs> listening and I really, really enjoyed sharing these few stories with you. Thank you, Ms. Natasha. I was struck most when you said that working in the field of culture needs balance of uh, needs a balance of head and heart. So thank you for your inspiring speech. And now, for the next phase of our program, we invite our speakers to come to the stage for the panel discussion. We have um, seats here on stage for our panel discussion. And I would also like to invite anyone who has questions. We have a microphone on the aisle. You may approach the microphone. We have ushers also in the audience area who will assist. Welcome po everyone to our panel discussion part. So bef um, kindly also, when you're asking a question, we would appreciate if you could tell us your name. Let's start with our first question. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Javier Ignacio Tapia Fernandez from De La Salle University, taking up 
Bachelor of Arts in Development Studies, Manual American Studies. Okay. Here's my question. As culture bearers and advocates, what barriers or obstacles have you encountered in your mission to promote culture as women? If they were, how were you able to face and overcome these barriers and, or obstacles? Thank you. I think one of the, thank you for your question. Um, and I think one of the main challenges so far that I've faced or seen um, is, I think what a lot of I've been talking about is people seeing culture as a, as a niche or a sector um, and not really seeing it as what ties everything together. So trying to get people, especially in the corporate space, to understand this is quite hard. Like for example, a lot of the work I do ranges not just from advocacy work and meeting with communities and really seeing them as friends rather than a beneficiary. I really, I hate this idea of kind of creating a divide between community and like benefactor and all these ideas. So even when working with different communities or working with, for example, a corporate, in a corporate setting, working on packaging, for example, it's very specific, but I'll just share this story, very specific when people talk about asking us, okay, you're a change agency, um, you use a lot of culture, can you put Filipino designs on our packaging? Can you take the banig and put it out there? Can you use these different motifs from the Inabel fabric and put it out on a packaging for, let's say, soda? And I feel like this is the idea also that we need to talk about, and the reason why we need to talk about culture as present everywhere because it isn't just talking about the patterns or the pretty things that we see, but the depth of the stories as to why we create and why we design. So that's kind of been the challenge now is really making people also take cultural barriers seriously and that the people that create these weavings aren't just using it because they aren't just creating these things because they're pretty or nice to look at, but also because there are stories behind every stitch. So these are the stories that need to be heard rather than kind of just saying, oh, this is a nice pattern we can apply, but understanding the underlying, I think, lessons that we can learn from our culture. So that's kind of been the main challenge, but it's been exciting to see how we can really change this and bring culture also into, into settings like this where normally people don't really think about it as well. Uh, as for me, I, in my three decades of cultural work, I see um, cultural sensitivity of people as um, a challenge because while we, while, while we enjoy um, traditional arts, traditional crafts, and all the rest of the art forms, um, we should also know that in every um, tradition or practice, um, there's meaning in every symbol, in every color that most of us won't um, even know or understand because we are not really aware of the values and significance of these cultural symbols. So the challenge is not because of my work with the communities because the communities are really... Um, they're really open with, with people understanding their culture. That's why the communities are also um, trying to um, make an effort for, for those non-community members to understand their culture. And I would like to also call upon the, those who are listening here or those who will be working or visiting even the communities as a tourist or for educational purposes that um, while we appreciate their culture, we have to understand the meaning of every, every art form, every symbol, 
that we experience in the community. For example, not all the traditional clothing can be used by every man and women. So some are used for sacred purposes and there are documentations that we do without consent from the community. So it's important to adhere with the free prior informed consent. That's one. The cultural, cultural sensitivity is also one. And also when we do um, research with the communities, we have to bring back what we what we extracted or we got from the community. So as students, as educators, as cultural workers, or even as tourists, we have to um, respect, that's the most important, respect uh, the cultural community's culture. Cultural communities would mean those not from the indigenous, and as culture bearers, actually we are all culture bearers, not just the indigenous peoples or members of the cultural communities, because we are also indigenous to the Philippines, so we are also indigenous peoples. Um, it's just that the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples have a list of uh, groups belonging to, to the indigenous people, so um, we are culture bearers, so we are also um, responsible in protecting our culture. So th this one is really a challenge because when we take pictures, we just post it without knowing that um, what we are posting in social media would, um, would mean something to the communities or it might have an effect on the community. So, so two things, cultural sensi sensitivity and respect to the community's um, traditional culture. <laughs> okay. I, I look at it from a um, macro perspective. In a uh, world that is dynamic, in a world that is fast becoming overrun by technology, I am challenged by um, striking a balance between preserving culture in its pure sense and the economic side of it. A lot of our communities in the cultural sphere, no? because of economic needs, they it, it, somehow we have to strike a balance between having to preserve it in its purest form and whether we are able to promote and create livelihood as part of the dynamics of the entire environment. And to me, that's, that's really a challenge. And I look at communication as key. I think in the age of technology, it now becomes incur inherent in everything that we do that we need to explain. We need to communicate. And to me, that is important. The, um, Issues of uh, cultural appropriation always comes into the picture, right? But who is to blame sometimes, right? Maybe it is us that should say rather than they doing what we feel is wrong. So I think this is part of the um, challenge that we all face as a country with rich culture. It is how we should look into marrying, um, marrying what we feel has to be preserved and making sure that our people are also being blessed with economic uh, prosperity. So I think this is something that we should all really look into 
and find solutions towards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just now, Belospo. A kind reminder, please speak clearly into the microphone so that our speakers can understand you well. Next question, please. Hello. Hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is Prince Ramos. I am from De La Salle University. I am taking up AB International Studies, major in European Studies. So, for context, realize that the spectrum of feminism is highly nuanced, encompassing diverse perspectives on the root causes of gender inequality and its solutions. Now, for all three speakers, with a focus on women's empowerment, what key actions or programs or even personal goals do you have planned for this coming year? Or maybe further elaborate on the plans. I'm sorry, could you please repeat the question? Okay. <clears throat> sorry. With a focus on women's empowerment, what key actions or programs or even personal goals do you have planned for this coming year? Or maybe further elaborate on them. Okay, you talk about personal goals, goals, right, for this year. Ah, I, I, I think, okay, I now chair the uh, Creative City Council of, uh, of the city of Baguio, and that's, that is a, a um, I've come full circle in that sense. And to me, there are so many plans moving forward. And I don't look at this year. I'm looking at years forward. It's visioning. It's visioning. I look at planning in a way that it becomes not just within this frame, but it becomes a, a plan that encompasses many years. In fact, um, I, we just finished our strategic planning session with uh, the, the uh, cross-section of the council of creative of, of Baguio and I said this is now how we should start planning and how we should look at it on a macro perspective I looked at it from the national development plan for instance of the Philippines and how it relates to the United Nations development plan cooperation framework because these are now being planned as we speak and these are plans that, uh, plans trajectory up to 2040. And for the city of Baguio, the development plan of the city of Baguio is 2043 already. So you see, we, all, all these plans now filters and cascades to our strategic plan as a creative city moving forward. So we look at the SDGs, we look at urban planning, we look at environment uh, solutions, and how the entire citizenry of a city like Baguio can be part of the story. I look at decongesting, I look at making Baguio green, because that's all part and parcel of being a creative city. Again, we look at how culture also um, uh, thrives, marrying together, how we can um, um, put environment and prosperity together. So to me, planning is not now, it is moving forward because it becomes a generational, um, generational capacity building for everybody. Thank you. I hope this <laughs> answers the question. Um, for my personal goal related to work, of course, um, there are two things, the intangible cultural heritage um, being integrated into um, the school curriculum. So we're trying to, to craft um, a, a program, a project, wherein all of this um, art forms that I've shown a while ago can be integrated, for example, in, in other countries, they do this. Um, the drum, the banging of the drum creates a sound, so it can be related to science. 
So now we are um, invited to pilot this um, ICH in education wherein um, the intangible cultural heritage and other tangible heritage can be integrated in the school curriculum, in the subjects, in, in, uh, in teaching. So another thing is the, I've mentioned that one of the challenges for safeguarding ICH is the um, ICH in emergencies, so the disasters, etc. Um, we're trying to um, to plan a strategy wherein the local government can integrate the traditional practices in the local DRRM. So um, the traditional practices of the communities which may signal when there's a typhoon coming or earthquake or some calamities may be um, included, integrated in the local DRR. So we've done um, workshops where the, the LGUs may um, partner with the communities and also um, the communities may be given, can be given attention by the local government when these um, disasters um, happen. So those are the two um, immediate um, personal goals related to work that I'm planning to pursue this year. So for this year, I actually love how it's very much connected <laughs> with Ms. Janice, even if we just met. Um, the, one of the first things that I started off this, I mean last year, was together with Isa Bart and Gab Mejia. We've been working on a grant together with National Geographic on how culture saves climate. So we've been doing a lot of work related to typhoon relief, all the way to rebuilding houses and cultural spaces in different communities, and we really noticed how the way communities bounce back, or the very first indicator of them finding hope once again, is the accessibility to cultural tools. And this is very important to talk about, especially in communities that really end up needing to sell these cultural tools to be able to make ends meet. So being able to visit the various regions and understanding how different practices innately within the community's culture actually address direct climate solutions has been very valuable because a lot of young people within these communities are the ones actually who were the ones telling us these stories. So it really shows the value of intergenerational culture. So last year we were able to work directly with these communities doing different workshops from photography, lending them cameras to be the ones to document their own communities rather than, than us. Because again, these are their stories and all we wanted to do was provide this platform for them. And other than that, we've also done different counter mapping workshops. So this is understanding their emotional connection to the land by asking them what spaces they feel safe in, what spaces they feel most happy in, what spaces they feel need more respect. So coming up with a community map and really understanding how they can now channel visual arts or photography to explain this, this map, this environmental and emotional map, allows you to kind of already see without even having to extract information from them, the value of the culture in knowing how to protect the environment. So we've done this workshop in 19 communities region, like nationwide. Mm -hmm. So we've gone to Batanes all the way to Basilan. And then this year, we're going back again to all um, to be able to exhibit now all the different photos and different climate solutions that already exist within these communities for them to now create cultural exchanges. Because what we were talking, when every, every time we met with a Datu or a Pangoo in um, Bagobo Clata, they'd always share how their dream was, you know, to be friends with other different indigenous communities, to learn from their practices. Because more often than not, these communities are quite remote, so it's hard for them to actually, you know, quote unquote, connect on Zoom. But that was the simple dream that they had. When we met with the Sama Bangi, um, head um, Kanas in Zamboanga. He was just making Granta how simply he wants to learn from the Aitas in Zambales. 
It's very simple things that you don't realize. Creating these connections can create a multiplicity of change. So this is something we're, we're working on. Um, but initially, what it really is first is getting this, the, the book together. So we call it the Philippine Youth Atlas, and Atlas is a compilation of maps. So all these maps will be compiled into a book that will be distributed to all 700 kids that participated in these workshops. And we're also putting together a, a exhibit through a grant with NCCA, actually, um, this coming November in Museo Pambata of all the different um, photos and artifacts, drawings, maps, to be able to show how during Environmental Month and Children's Month, which is um, November, that all these things are interconnected. And later on as well, we're even doing workshops in Hong Kong to really also understand how diaspora or imagined 18th region comes into play. And also doing a similar workshop in London in September also. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. May we have the next guest? Good afternoon, I'm Chloe Villana. I'm from De La Salle University, and I'm an American Studies major. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and to thank the speakers for their wonderful and insightful presentations. As for my question, this is directed towards all speakers. In your view, what is the most effective and feasible way to sustainably preserve the local culture of indigenous Filipino women amidst globalization? Thank you. May we repeat the question? Sure. In your view, what is the most effective and feasible way to sustainably preserve the local culture of indigenous Filipino women amidst globalization? I, I think the, the safeguarding of um, once Communities culture should come from the communities themselves. It shouldn't come from um, any, any organization or agency outside the community. It should come from them. So what we can do is, ju um, is just to, to inspire them to continue their work in sustaining um, the safeguarding of their culture because they're the ones who um, identify which particular culture is important to them to safeguard and we um, as government agencies and non-government organizations um, just inspire them to continue their work and for that uh, I think we should help them value their, their culture by helping them, assisting them in the promotion, in their creation of, of their um, art forms, and in documenting their, their traditional culture. So with, with those strategies, we inspire them to, to safeguard their culture by themselves and inspire them to do the documentation by local researchers, not from the outsiders. And I think that would help them um, sustain safeguarding of their culture. If I may, um, to give chance to the other questions, maybe if the speakers are amenable, maybe we can have one answer per question, one or two. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi, I am Chloe Novenario. I come from De La Salle University, and I am currently in AB Organizational Communication. So, uh, first, I wanted to thank you for that whole um, discussion. Um, you really helped me realize just how significant we are to Philippine And the, fir um, the question I wanted to ask is actually for um, 
Filipino women who live abroad or who grew up in another country, let's say Filipino women who grew up in America. Um, so how can they be cultural bearers with, um, like, while being far away from the Philippines? Um, what is the best and most respectful way for them? Okay. Um, that's a really good question because right now I'm working with this group of two Filipinas. They lead this movement called Kamusta Balikbayan. And they're trying to explore how to connect the diaspora together, especially young, young women. Um, what's really nice about this movement is that they have lived, I think they're based in Hong Kong, but it's really nice to see how the core of the project really first and foremost connects with connects to individuals that are at home and not being afraid to create that barrier because I feel like being able to create these exchanges instead of kind of creating a division between diaspora and those living at home um, allows, uh, doesn't really allow the conversation to flow on how we can expand the idea of Filipino culture outside of our archipelago. And I think one exciting way really is since now with, I mean, technology and all these things, we're really able to also do our own research and reach out to different people that are within the, these cultural spaces. And again, a lot of the, the cultural knowledge when, it, when we talk about, you know, indigenous, indigenous culture, as, as mentioned previously, we all are indigenous to our own spaces. So how Filipinos that are third generation that grow up, for example, in Hong Kong or in the U.S., how do they connect to their Filipino culture as indigenous Filipinos living somewhere else? So I think it's, instead of creating divides, it's seeing an imaginary 18th region of the Philippines that exists everywhere and really being able to explore what the mix of these cultures mean. So instead of really seeing culture as like a pure, from a purest way, of understanding what it means to be Filipino. I think it's also accepting the, the woven tapestry that we can continue creating by understanding how different cultures come together to create what is Filipino. And I mean, we've been colonized for, for many, many years. So seeing how, for example, adobo stemmed from a lot of different cultures, but then in the end, we made it our own. I think that recipe is something that we can also look at when it comes to diaspora. How are they able to create their own recipe of what Filipino is and how do they make that their own? Thank you so much for that. Thank you. We have time for one last question. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Mary Carl P. Boasen, and I am from the University of Santo Tomas, currently a graduate, uh, graduating student of the AB Asian Studies and the president of the USD Asian Studies Society. So um, I want to also emphasize that I am a part of the indigenous community, uh, four indigenous groups in the Philippines. So I am really a proud Katotobo. And thank you for all of your discussions. They're really um, informative and uh, close to my heart. Um, but sorry, um, <laughs> what's breaking my heart as a woman and an IT is that Whenever we talk about crafts and creative works of the IPs, there will always be these issues wherein the traditional designs and works of the IPs are being copied without their consent, despite the existence of, F of FPIC, and being sold to other areas. Aside from my observations as an IP, personally, there has this thought wherein it says, we saw our designs being sold, and it is nice that people get to know them. But it is sad because it is not us, IPs, who made them. In order to maintain culture's sustainability and uplift respect towards IP culture, how can we combat the lurking copycat businesses wherein they use the textiles, patterns, and culture of the IPs that only benefit themselves and not the IPs? Thank you. Um, that, that is a very sticky question, actually. Um, I think there are safeguards also whereby cultural appropriations are being uh, discussed and addressed. 
And I think uh, there is a um, law, no? the, the Indigenous Peoples Act. Uh, there is a law that, that covers that. But you see, um, in the age of technology, <laughs> this, is, this is something that uh, we cannot police. As I said earlier, I think it becomes incumbent in all of us to understand how we are able to exchange. What is it that we really want with our culture? Is it to keep it in its pure sense or, or adopt it in a more dynamic way and still maintain that identity? So this is the challenge that, that we also pose. That's why it is important, as I said earlier, that communication is key. I think we make use of, of the, all the channels on how we can express uh, our cultural uh, needs, our, our cultural um, prohibitions. So I think this is something that we should do because now it is important for other people outside of the cultural sphere that we are able to express who we are. And to me, that is simply the um, important factor of pride of place. So it now becomes incumbent also in, all, in, in everyone who are culture bearers to make sure which is given priority and which is given a balance. Whether you want it um, exposed for promotion, for marketing, for livelihood, etc., or whether you just want to keep it as an exhibit. So to me, uh, I, I feel that this is a very sensitive matter. In, in, our, uh, in the culture of the Cordilleras, I believe that this is something that everyone in, in, in the Cordilleras feel, feel have to be protected. There are things that we need to protect. And to me, this is where our identity actually as creative people comes into play. Creativity is universal. It is, creativity is an expression. And this is also why our cultural bearers do the things that they do because it is part of a heritage generational expression. So it now becomes part of our mindset and I think to us, um, uh, I, to us, it becomes incumbent for us to communicate it. It is communication that is key. Thank you, Paul. Do you have any additional comments from our speakers? The, the, the law that was mentioned is the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, wherein we should adhere with a free prior informed consent also, we are encouraging those creators to register their works. Um, the indig Intellectual Property Office, IPOFIL, uh, provides free, free seminars on the registration of works. And also, I think there's um, the communities themselves are we as um, advocates of um, safeguarding of our culture should also assert our right um, if ever uh, there's I think there's one case that um, the textiles are imitated by printing instead of weaving traditionally they are printed and being sold at a really cheap really cheap amount, really cheap cost, and uh, there was an ordinance or a policy um, formulated to, to prevent the, the copying of the indigenous textiles. So I think uh, we all have our part in protecting our culture um, in the country and outside the country. So I encourage everyone to, to um, learn more, understand more our culture, our um, indigenous uh, cultural communities, culture, because we are all responsible with, with the promotion and the protection. 
and also with the documentation of our traditional and cultural communities culture. Thank you. Um, just to like share, I know a lot of you I think are like international studies or like or man um, students. So within like your work, I think it's really nice that you were able to kind of listen or, or be a part of this space because what I noticed in a lot of more serious NGO work is that culture itself is what will also make you stand out because these are the solutions that you can actually provide that are diverse and unique to being Filipino. And so when we talk about even, for example, solutions for like the climate crisis in, in, in the type of work that I do, we really found what made it more relatable and exciting for people was when we really centered it and grounded it on culture and creativity. Normally, these are the last things that people think about when you're trying to address, for example, when a after a typhoon happens, this is the last thing you think about, like how doing art with kids. But in reality, we, what we ended up doing was testing out what if we reverse that. So when, for example, the typhoon Odette hit in 2021, and our partner community in Halian Island almost was completely lost. The rumor going around is that everyone on the island died and perished. Um, but in the end, they all survived. And the reason for that was because of their spirit of Bayanihan. But more than that, to recover, how we started actually assisting with these efforts was really first understanding what the community's culture was. And they are an island community, so automatically it's the boats to reestablish their livelihood um, with the ocean. And it's now also doing psychosocial therapy with the kids to be able to bounce back into, you know, into regular life despite everything else being kind of um, damaged around them. And we did different art therapy classes with the kids, and Halian Island became one of the first islands again to open up school within um, the Surigao region. They were also winning different um, literacy awards by DepEd. So all these different things started happening that they didn't realize they were, the community was capable of, and they were kind of like thanking us. But what I wanted to tell them is that this was all coming from them. So you really see that when we work with these communities, it, it really has to start from the community, as previously mentioned, that the reality is that NGOs actually should not exist. And if we were in this perfect world, we would be able to kind of have the communities be self-sufficient. And so when you, when you come into communities or want to work with them and be able to connect with them, you have to be able to also think about that what you're doing there is making sure they themselves are the ones leading the discussion, leading the design solutions and co-creating with them rather than imposing anything. Because in the end, these communities are the ones that are the true cultural bearers and have all the solutions possible. Thank you to our cultural bearers who shared their knowledge this afternoon. I will re return to the lectern for our next part of the program. To officially end the Jeronima T. Texon Women's Forum, Filipino Women as Culture Bearers, may I call Ms. Lindsay A. Barrientos, Deputy Executive Director of the UNESCO National Commission of the Philippines, to say a few words. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon again to all of you. I will just say a few words. Actually, this was uh, from uh, the, a former Director General of UNESCO. Uh, former Director General of UNESCO, Madam Irina Bokova. Where in she said before, well, I... Okay, so while well, there has been progress across the world, Inequality persists with regard to who participates in and contributes to and benefits from culture. She said that we still need to build peace and forge equitable public policies that would also build better future for all. And it requires the full and equal participation of all women and men in the cultural sphere. As we move forward, every society must support the empowerment of all of its citizens as wellsprings for innovation and dynamism. 
It is in this light that we in UNICOM, we continue to promote especially one of the pillars of UNESCO on gender equality. And we believe that it is high time that we highlight also the importance of culture, not only for sustainable development goals, but also in ensuring that uh, women, most importantly, are part of all these plans and um, aspirations that we have. So um, we express our gratitude for your presence here today. It is heartwarming to celebrate not just being a woman, but being with those who appreciate women and the crucial role as culture bearers of women. We thank our partners in the DFA Office of Cultural Diplomacy, led by Ase Kuki Feria. Salamat po, ma'am. Also to Ma'am Emmy, to Miss Liza, Miss Berlin, and to all of you wonderful creative OCD uh, uh, team whom we work with in preparation for this event. Thank you to the other offices in DFA who supported us in this endeavor and also participated in the forum today. We are also joined by UNICOM partners from academic institutions and clubs for UNESCO, a nationwide movement powered by the youth, whom we work hand in hand with to promote UNESCO programs. I thank my teammates in UNICOM, this project led by our focal person for gender and development, Mr. Rex Subak Jr. Uh, this brought good memories for the team of the very first Senator Jeronima Pexon, held also here in DFA, also in partnership with D, uh, DFA, nun po OPCD pa, and then ngayon uh, with OCD na. And also, uh, it brought us new ideas and inspiration for the next forum and activities. Thank you to our dearest resource persons who inspired us today and made us look forward to potential collaborations relating to culture and creativity and reminding us to never stop dreaming, not just for women, but most importantly for girls who are also culture bearers. We have a lot to reflect on and share based on your experiences and insights as women culture bearers. Maraming maraming salamat po sa lahat. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lindsay. May I request you to please remain on stage along with our speakers. And also, may I request Ase Kuki Feria to please join us for the awarding of certificates. This Certificate of Appreciation is given to Renee Talavera in recognition of her invaluable insights and contributions as resource speaker during the Jeronima T. Pexon Women's Forum, Filipino, Filipino Women as Culture Bearers, organized by the Department of Foreign Affairs in collaboration with the UNESCO National Commission of the Philippines. Round of applause, please. This Certificate of Appreciation is given to Natasha Tangutko. And of course, this Last but not the least, this Certificate of Appreciation is given to Marie Venus Tan. One last photo.
Thank you. Thank you for Thank you everyone. So today Today, we witness the strength and wisdom of three remarkable Filipino women who serve as culture bearers of our country. We would like to extend our gratitude to our esteemed guests who have generously shared their insights, creativity, and passion with us. Your words and presence have filled this event with cultural celebration and enrichment. We invite everyone to partake of some refreshments outside of Bulwagang Apolinario Mabini. This has been Berlin Dayakap, your host for today. Good afternoon. May we request Unicom and OCD to please proceed in front for a photo op. 